evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us tonight as we continue this series of Through the Bible. Tonight, we're going to be overviewing the book of Galatians, but we're going to do it through the lens of the first missionary journey. Uh, the reason for doing that is I think sometimes it's easy to forget that when Scripture was written, it was written by real people to real people. Those real people existed in a historical and a cultural context. And the issues that the Holy Spirit wanted to address in the life of the church. What makes it scripture is the fact that the Holy Spirit has superintended it, not just for them then, but it has truth that can be extrapolated for all time that we seek to apply today. So I think looking at it this way will help us to appreciate the historical cultural context in which the book of Galatians was written. So without any further ado, let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, our Father, our Savior, and our Sovereign Lord, we bless your name and give you thanks for this, an extension of your love and mercy that we're able to gather virtually to give visible evidence of our faith, affirm our love and our loyalty to you, I pray, Father, that you'd be pleased to forgive me of my sin, that nothing would prohibit you from standing in my body, thinking with my mind, speaking with my voice. Uh, touch my lips like you did for Isaiah, that your word not return empty, but accomplish what you please where you send it. I pray, Father, that this overview might be meaningful both to those who know and love you, and those who don't, both to those who have experience with the study of your word and for those for whom this is a new and afresh. Therefore, I pray that you'd open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your word of life. Open our ears that we might hear what your spirit is saying to your church. Then free us in our emotions that we might carry out those things that you would have us to know and to do. This is my prayer in Jesus' name, and for his reputation's sake I pray. Amen. Tonight, uh, we're going to be looking at this uh, first missionary journey, and I want to start with a picture of the map that encompasses it. Uh, we don't know the exact routes. We, we do have the names of, of, of cities, but all of the ancient routes that were taken that day were not present today. But we can guesstimate that even though this was the shortest of the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, this journey encompassed about 1,400 to 1,500 miles. That's just on this journey. Some of it was by sea, some of it was by land. And that which was by land necessitated that they were walking from place to place. Uh, this view of the map uh, shows two significant aspects. The portion that is to the lower right is the first missionary journey, and then that line that you see across the top, that's what's known as the Ignatian Way. Uh, both the Ignatian Way is a route that was paved by the Romans around the second century, which allowed travel across the great plateau of Turkey um, <clears throat> and crosses over into to Greece as well. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we begin to look at uh, the second and the third missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. But uh, that's what you're seeing in this particular graphic. And I didn't have one that didn't show that, so just wanted to explain that to us. That is not part of the first missionary journey. First missionary journey is located specifically to that uh, right-hand side quadrant. Um, <clears throat> for reference sake... Uh, if you, uh, we'll be looking at the book of Acts, specifically chapters 13, 14, as we make our way through this first missionary journey. 
In Acts chapter 13, the first three verses, Luke records that Barnabas and Saul were set apart for the special work by the congregation of the church at Antioch. It's not real clear in this graphic, but there are two Antiochs. Uh, the one, uh, it, we have um, Syrian Antioch, and the other is Pisidian Antioch. When we get to a later graphic, you'll be able to see those two in a lot more detail, but they're part of this first missionary very journey. They began their mission from Seleucia, the Mediterranean port city, which was 17 miles west of Antioch. That would be Syrian Antioch. And then they sailed 120 miles to Salamis. That's the eastern port city of Cyprus. Cyprus is Barnabas's hometown. The city had diminished in the Roman period when the capital of the island was moved from uh, Salamis to Paphos. Nevertheless, there remained a significant Jewish community in Cyprus. In the synagogues of Samalus, the Bible records where Saul and Barnabas proclaimed the word of the Lord. We see that in Acts chapter 13, verse 5. Traveling over the land across Cyprus, the company would have arrived, that's uh, Paul and Barnabas, would have arrived at Paphos on the southwestern coast of the island. The fame of the ancient city was attached to its temple of Aphrodite that's mentioned by Homer in his uh, Iliad. And the city grew in importance during the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. Sergio Paulus, the Roman proconsul stationed there, requested to hear from Saul and Barnabas. He accepted the new faith in spite of the interference of Elamus, a magician, and after witnessing a miracle at the hands of Saul. Let's uh, take a look at, at Acts chapter 13. And I want to begin around verse 4, and we'll read through verse 13. The Bible says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. This would be John Mark. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul. Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, uh, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. 
This gives us the historical and the scriptural aspect of what's taking place as we look at this first missionary journey. As we read, they sailed from Paphos to Perga in the province of Pamphylia. This is a picture of the city gates of Perga. These are ancient ruins that remain to this day, or at least they were present at the time that I took this picture, which would have been about, I want to say, around somewhere between 2004 and 2000. Six. No mention at this point is made of Italia. That would be the Mediterranean harbor that was about 10 miles to the southwest of Perger. It was a natural seaport and destination from Pathos. Uh, we can probably assume that Luke, in his narrative, knew that Italia was the point of disembarkation, and from there they just walked. So didn't make many, any mention of it. It could be because there was no synagogue that was present there. Could be because there was no missionary activity there. In any case, it was a natural transit point on the way to Perga, the metropolis of Pamphylia. And what we're seeing is, is that uh, the... Apostle Paul, in his ministry, looks to go in urban areas where people are gathering. He's not staying out in the rural side. He's looking to be in the marketplace where there's the center of culture and, and life and, and people are, uh, and there's an influx of people that's coming around. There are archaeological remains that point to a road between Italia and Perga that were built during the reign of Tiberius. We don't know a lot about Paul's visit to Perga. All we are told is for some expected or unexplained reason, rather, John Mark abandoned Barnabas and Paul and returned to Jerusalem. Maybe it was seeing Edomus the magician. Maybe he was just overwhelmed with what was, was going on. We don't know. However, we do know that his desertion would later be a point of friction between Paul and Barnabas. We read about that in Acts chapter 15 as they're preparing to go on their second missionary journey to return to the places that they established on the first to come back for, for the purpose of encouraging and strengthening them. And Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark with them and Paul didn't think it was a good idea to bring the one who had abandoned them on the mission. Why he left? We don't know. Uh, we do know, however, that they did reconcile. Uh, Paul mentions later towards uh, the latter parts, the latter years of his life and latter stages of his ministry, just how profitable John Mark is for him. So even though it was a point of contention, there also was reconciliation. No evidence of a Jewish settlement at Perga, though there is mention of Jews in the province of Pamphylia. This is a picture of the remains of the uh, Augustaceum that's located in Pisidian Antioch. On this map, you can see these places a little closer. Uh, way down here at the south, we have Jerusalem. They were up here. It was the church at Antioch that sent them on this mission. They leave 
from Antioch. They set sail. They come to Cyprus. They disembark. They go across the island to Paphos and then uh, travel from, pa from Perga would have followed along the Centrus River to uh, the Via Sabaste. That's the, the Roman road that was built in the 6th century BC by Caesar Augustus. Uh, one of the things that we see is how the Romans really laid the foundation for the spread of the gospel, more than 50,000 miles of road that they laid down with stone to be able to allow travel to pass from city to city and from town to town. And the apostle took advantage of that as a means to be able to share the gospel. Uh, the Roman colony was situated in the province of Phrygia that was near the frontier of Pisidia. So we can see that in, in this journey, uh, we've got quite a bit that goes by sea and quite a bit that travels by land. And we can see that they go as far as Derby, then begin to backtrack and go back before they make their return back to Antioch. Or rather, and that would be Syrian Antioch. The ancient remains of Pisidian Antioch have been identified with the ruins just east of the Mardin city of uh, Yalvak in Turkey. The city th thrived after Augustus annexed the region and reestablished it as a Roman colony, populating it with veterans of the Roman 5th and 7th legions. The Jewish community there may have resulted from the colonization of Phrygia and Lydia by Antiochus III. This is a picture of St. Peter's Church in Antioch, which outside the Church of Jerusalem, it was the most important early church in biblical history. As a matter of fact, the blessing that should have come to the church at Jerusalem went to the church at Antioch because they were mission-minded in seeing that the gospel would reach the ends of the earth. The Bible says that on the Sabbath, Paul and Barnabas entered the synagogue where Luke reports the congregation listened to the reading of the law and the prophets. Luke's account is the earliest record of the Jewish practice to read the Hebrew prophets following the weekly reading of the Torah in the synagogue. Let's go there and take a look. In Acts chapter 13, beginning at verse 13, and then going down to verse 16. The Bible says, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Pathos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, Listen, 
I'm going to stop right there for the time being. Men of God and or men of Israel and you who fear God having been invited to speak these this rather dual representation or dual terms of address signify the apostles hearers and are repeated throughout his journey and they suggest and paint a picture for us of the diverse composition of the synagogue audiences. Men of Israel would recognize that these are Jews who are in the synagogue and you who fear God recognizes that a number of the Gentile God fears, not proselytes in that they've been converted to Judaism, but maybe semi-proselytes or sympathizers who had abandoned pagan practices associated with the Jewish communities in the dispersion of the Jews and they became the focal point of Paul's mission to the Gentiles. Now already we can see that if we go back to the time before Christ, Judaism was strict in its separatism. Were non-Jewish people allowed to worship? Yes, they were but they worshiped in the, at the temple in the court of women. Now that Christ has come and has risen and the gospel is now beginning to spread and the reason that it left Jerusalem was because of persecution. And as people were going and talking about faith in Jesus Christ, and now as Paul is out there going to a place where the gospel has not been preached, you have people who have turned away from idols and pagan worship who have a heart for God but have never practiced Judaism. And you have Jews who have who are embracing Christ as the Messiah. Two diverse, different kinds of audience. Now, coming together to worship together, you can begin to see how some of the problems that they might have as a result of being blended together in worship. One of those problems might be, hmm, we're worshiping together. They're looking to accept Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of Moses and the prophets. They got to be like us first, then turn to Christ. That's a problem. Others, problems that would exist might not necessarily be th theologically, but might be practically. In the context of worship, where things are trying to be done decent and in order, questions are rising and people are wondering, well, what's going on? Why are they doing this? Why is this taking place? And their questions are disrupting the flow of worship of God. And so we can see, not so much for this book at Galatians, but in other letters where we see similar kind of cultural things taking place, why instructions are given, let them learn at home if they have questions because it's being disruptive to the order. And this is how we can maintain good order and discipline. Uh, all of this sets as a, as a backdrop the message of Paul and Barnabas received mixed 
reception in this church at Pasadena and Antioch, leading them to abandon the city and continue on the Roman road 90 miles to Iconium. Once again, the apostles entered the local synagogue to proclaim the word of grace. Divided opinions among the people of the city regarding the new message grew to the point of violence, and they had to flee 20 miles to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycaonia and to the surrounding country. Let's take a look. We'll pick up We'll pick up in verse 44. It says, The next day, the, or the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 14, it says, Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Again, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord and bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them, and to stone them, they learned of it, fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycaonia, and to the surrounding country, and there they continued to preach the gospel. So you see, uh, opposition coming early in the life of the spread of the gospel, in the life of the ministry of the apostle, uh, Jew adamant against stirring up other Jews and even Gentiles to get them to join together in the persecution. Uh, Luke records that the party returned on the same route by which they had arrived to Derby. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium 
and to Antioch. Not only did they continue to preach in these cities, they appointed leaders for the fledging congregations. Turning south, they crossed the southwestern portions of the province of Galatia into Pisidia and finally to the province of Pamphylia, in which were the cities of Perga and Adalia. From this port city, they set sail and returned to Syrian Antioch, where they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. That continues through Acts chapter 14, where we see Paul and Barnabas at, at Lystra. Paul is stoned at Lystra, first missionary journey, first time out the gate. It's a short journey come back by comparison to the, to the second and third. Uh, but uh, chapter four, uh, 14, verse 20, but when the disciples gathered about him, he, well, well let me back up to 19. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds. Now watch this. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. They thought they had beat him to death. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The next verses tell us how they get back to where they started from. But we see the, the essence of this journey, the challenges that they had now the task is at hand, if you think about it. They have preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in cities who are hearing it for the first time. They may have had news from, the, from some who had traveled back from Jerusalem because every Jewish male was required to go to Jerusalem at least three times a year for the feast. And maybe they had heard about what had happened to Christ. Maybe they had heard on Pentecost what happened, but now they're hearing the gospel firsthand from an apostle who has been appointed to preach to the Gentiles. Now, let's step into the world of the apostle Paul. Here he is. He has been beaten already and left for dead. They thought he was dead. Not just the enemies, but his friends, when they gathered around him, thought he was dead, but he gets up. So he's, he's got to be beat and hurt pretty bad, but yet he continues. He continues on the journey to preach the gospel. I think part of his burden is how do I in the wake of what has happened to me that many of these people have witnessed, encourage them to continue in a faith that has resulted in me suffering like this. Hence, a letter to the Galatians and the Galatian church. Hence, against that, that backdrop, seeing and understanding that uh, the statement of faith and giving visible evidence 
of our faith, being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, carries some associated costs. And how can putting somebody in charge, a leader who may not know as much as the people that they are leading, how can you encourage them in these times? This is a Roman millstone, or milestone, I should say. Uh, we would call it, and it's where we get, our, it's a prototype of what we would call mile markers today. They were pillars of, of stone with inscriptions that included the distance from the start or the head of the road with the name of the Roman official in charge of its construction or repair work, as well as the name of the current consul, uh, whether it be a republic or if it was during the reign of an emperor, it would have the name of the emperor inscribed on it. That takes us then to the book of Galatians. In Acts chapter 15, we have the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council comes about, again, uh, let's go there right quick. The Jerusalem Council comes about because the number of Gentiles in the church are increasing. And it brought to the forefront the question of the Gentiles' relationship to the law and to the people of Israel. Some folk argued that unless you are circumcised and walk according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. We see that in Acts 15.1. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. Now, Peter's a leader at the Church of Jerusalem, along with James. Not James, the brother of John, but James, the brother of our Lord Jesus, the writer of the book of James. They're leaders in the church at Jerusalem. The Bible says that uh, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that they will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent 
and they listened to Barnabas and Saul as they related four signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James, this is the brother of Jesus, replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return. I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. He says, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them. What are we going to write? This is what we're going to tell them. To abstain from the things polluted by idols, number one, from sexual immorality, that's number two, from what has been strangled, that's number three, and from blood, that's number four. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogue. All right. That was, a, that was the purpose of the church meeting. Now, I wanted to outline those four things. Why? Well, uh, many of you may or may not be familiar with the Talmud. The Talmud was the were the writings of the Jewish rabbis, which were not commentaries, but more or less theological practices of how we ought to live. Now, according to the Talmud, this is not scripture, but according to the Talmud, from the time of Noah, there were what's known as seven Noahide laws that have been traditionally enumerated. Not to worship idols, not to curse God, not to commit murder, not to commit adultery or sexual immorality, not to steal, not to eat flesh torn from a living animal, and to establish courts of justice. What we see in their prescription here is the fact that there was knowledge of and practice during the time of the writing of this council letter of the Noahide, um, I was about to say Talmud, but of, of, of the Noahide covenant the practice of those seven things. And and here they take four of those sevens and tell them, hey, to do this and make sure that they don't do this. This is what we're going to encourage them them to do. Just wanted to point that out since, since we were there. That takes us then to where we are with an overview of the book of Galatians. The apostle in referring to Galatia is using the term Galatia in its wider political sense as a province of Rome. This means that the churches that he has in mind in this epistle were in the cities that he evangelized during his first missionary journey with Barnabas. That would be Pathos, Pamphylia, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. This was prior to the Jerusalem Council. I point out the council because we see the council takes place before we get to the second missionary journey that begins in Acts 16. But before the council, this letter to these churches that he's visited is, is written. In writing this letter to the Galatians, the visit that he references 
in Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, must have been the visit of Acts 11, verses 27 through 30, where there was coming for famine relief. And so Galatians then would have been written in Syrian Antioch around A.D. 49, just before the apostle went to the council in Jerusalem. Why do I say that? Just so that we get a little bit of the not just historical, not just the cultural, but the biblical context as well in terms of what's taking place. And even uh, as best we can to understand the mindset of the apostle as he goes to them, because the, the whole goal of them is understanding that they are free in Christ. Now, the question is, what does this freedom look like? What does it mean? We've got rules, and rules without relationship is simply legalism. Then we have relationship, but no rules, but that's lawlessness. So we have to uh, be a part of understanding that freedom in light of rules and relationship that we might have life. And so in writing this book, we can see clearly the unfolding of three major sections which give us or reveal the three purposes for which this letter was written. Justification by faith, apart from the works of the law, is the, th is the urgent theme and the corrective nature of this book. Chapters 1 and 2 were written to defend Paul's apostolic authority because this establishes his gospel message. Many of the Jews, why should we listen to you? You weren't walking with Christ when Christ lived. Who made you an apostle? How are you an apostle? So he has to defend his apostleship. You'll discover in other writings, as the time goes on, his apostleship has been validated, vindicated. He doesn't have to defend it, but here he does. He has to establish that he is an apostle in his own right. Chapters 1 and 2 do that. Chapters 3 and 4 were written to give a theological defense of the principle of justification by faith to refute the false teaching of justification by the law. And then chapters 5 and 6 were written to show that liberty from the law does not mean lawlessness as many of the apostles' opponents has, had claimed. So this letter shows that the believer is no longer under the law, but is saved by faith alone. It has been said that Judaism was the cradle of Christianity, but also that it was very nearly its grave as well. God raised up Paul as the Moses of the Christian church to deliver the Gentiles from this bondage. So then Galatians is the Christian's declaration of independence. The power of the Holy Spirit enables the Christian to enjoy freedom within the law of love. Key verses. The first one is in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. 
I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Powerful verse. Christ gave his, cut his life short so that we might live forever. Now, the life that we live, since we have been crucified with Christ, dead to sin, no longer living therein, then it's we who no longer live, but Christ now gets to live again as we live this life in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And then Galatians 5.1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit to a yoke of slavery. So then, what, what does it mean to be free? In justification, we are free from the penalty of sin. We're set free from the power of sin. Sin has no dominion over us. How then do we live as free people? What does it mean? Well, freedom must not be used as an opportunity for the flesh. That is, now that you're free, you can do what you want to do because you've grown. But freedom gives us the opportunity through love to serve one another. And the picture of that is in chapter 5. Chapter 5 of Galatians records the power of that freedom. Now watch this. What's that power look like? Well, first of all, walk in the spirit. And the product, what's that? That's the fruit of the spirit. So we walk in the spirit, that's the power. The product or the result of that power is the fruit of the spirit. And that translates into our freedom in Christ Jesus. Then as is our custom, how do we see Christ in Galatians? Well, he's freed the believer from bondage to the law, that's legalism, and to sin, that's license, and has placed the believer in a position of liberty. The transforming cross provides for the believer's deliverance from the curse of sin, law, self, that results in and culminates in death. It's because of Christ that we have been set free and made free. Well, that's an overview of the book of Galatians through the lens of the first missionary journey. This is a good place to pause and entertain any questions you may have, any points that I made that need further clarification or amplification, or any comments that you might want to share. For those who are watching virtually, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, type them in the chat. If you are watching a replay, 
of this broadcast uh, and you have questions, you can type them in the chat and I go back from time to time and uh, I'll tag you in a response that I, that I leave and give. If you're in Zoom and you have a question, please feel free. Uh, question, comment, point that needs to be clarified. Uh, feel free to come off Zoom and ask away. Pastor. Yes, Deacon Copeland. Uh, you mentioned about Paul taking Barnabas. Did he take a Titus with him when he went to Jerusalem? Uh, not on this first missionary journey, no. Okay. Uh, Paul's custom, and we'll see that when we look at the second and third missionary journey, once he established a church to have competent leadership there in place. And okay. so on this first journey, it was really just three of them, mm -hmm. uh, Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. Okay. And based upon how we read the biblical text beginning out in Acts 13, Barnabas is the principal of the team. Okay. We know that because his name's listed first. All right. It's not until of uh, the apostolic light falls on, well, let me not say it like that. Uh, I know what I mean when I say that, but uh, for clarity's sake, uh, we can infer from a lot of things that we see that perhaps maybe Paul had a speech impediment. The Bible says that thorn that he had, he described it as the messenger of Satan. But we look at two thirds of the New Testament was written by the apostle. And he himself says he didn't come with eloquence of speech. Mm -hmm. In any case, the spotlight starts off on Barnabas, uh, but it quickly switches to the, uh, to the apostle, particularly after the encounter with Elamus the magician. And from mm -hmm. that point on, it's Paul and Barnabas as opposed to Barnabas and Saul. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Tyree. Yes, Sister Evans. Um, it was really encouraging when you were in Acts, um, talked about when you read, um, I think it was 19, Acts 14, 19, uh, when they thought Paul was dead. Yeah. <laughs> they drug him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up. That was very encouraging to me. That tells me, <laughs> even though <laughs> people can think you're dead, <laughs> you get up. God has all power. And the other thing you talked about was um, in Galatians, you ask the question, what does that mean to be free? And it doesn't give us, um, I, I, I suppose, um, talking about flesh, that doesn't give us license to do what we want to do, even though we know that God is a forgiving God, um, but um, just reminds me of I still need to be, I will be accountable for my life and what I do and what I say. So thank you so much um, for the study. Well, God bless you for that, uh, Sister Evans. I, I think it's one of those things that as members of the body of Christ that we probably ought to routinely remind ourselves of. I think, well, I shouldn't say I think, I know that we have a lot of Christian liberty. And the scripture even talks about that. 
But it also says that if what I do is going to adversely cause a brother or sister in Christ to stumble or fall, then I ought not to do it. Even though I'm free to do it, for the sake of that other person, I ought not to do it. And I think sometimes we, and it might just be where our society is at this particular juncture in time, that people think that because they are who they are, that they can do what they want to do because of their freedom, not recognizing what that freedom might do to somebody who, A, might not be mature in the faith, B, might not be strong in the faith, C, might have placed uh, false expectations on somebody else. Um, and, and so I think that that, that individual, that, that we need to be aware of that and govern ourselves accordingly. Not because those things or pr those practices have a salvific component to it, but because they do have uh, a brotherly or sister involvement component to them in terms of does it build up or does it tear down? Does it make them stronger or does it contribute to, to a moment of weakness? A, a simple thing like that the freedom that we have in Christ, uh, we could uh, use real wine in celebration of the Lord's Supper. But in as much as we are a ministry that ministers to everybody, what about those people who are in recovery and even though it's a small cup, that one taste could set them back. So for the sake of wanting to be more closer in line with what they drank in Scripture compared to the responsibility for my brother and sister who may be struggling. It doesn't do anything to take away from the celebration, but it can do a lot to go to make stronger a brother or sister in Christ. Thank you for that. And the other question I have, you mentioned apostle. Um, the definition um, for apostle, would you say that it should be the same definition or how do one become an apostle? I know that God appointed then, but is it is it the same? I, I just need some clarification. I, I don't know if I'm asking what I'm trying to think. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, to think um, to in Paul's day and time. Okay. L let me answer that question like that, uh, Sister Evans. A and the question uh, for those who may not have heard the question deals with uh, apostleship. So let's let's deal with the the word first. Apostle, apostolos. It's a noun, and it comes from the Greek verb apostello, which means to send. So, looking at it from a, a definition perspective, anybody who is sent or one who is sent would be an apostle. 
when we look at the office of apostle, then I think the key is to understand it in light of how those in first century understood it. And the criteria of first century was a very narrow criteria because even though by definition it may be one cent, from the criteria that they used in the first sentence, first century, it required a person to A, have lived during the time of Christ. B, have been eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Three, had been picked by Christ himself. Now, that's why when we see the defense of the apostleship of Christ, uh, I'm sorry, of of uh, the Apostle Paul, when we see the defense of his apostleship, he addresses those particular things. Now, the, the question that we would ask today, do we have anybody today who was living during the time that Jesus Christ lived and walked the earth? Well, I think the people would have to answer that for themselves. I, my ultimate answer might would be no, but uh, for the sake of someone saying that they lived before and have come back, handpicked by Christ. Again, if you were living during the time of Christ, it seems to be handpicked by Christ. Uh, but Paul was handpicked by Christ, as a matter of fact, and, and Christ calling for the Apostle Paul, very much different from everybody else. Everybody else, he said, follow me. Stop what they're doing. They followed him. For the Apostle, he had to blind him, knock him off his beast, call him by his name, and then get him to the point where he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. We read that account several times in the book of Acts as he gives his own personal testimony and encounter with God himself. Uh, so in, in looking at it um, from that perspective, using the criteria that those in the first century had, there would not be apostles today. Mm -hmm. If we look at it from just a use of words, mm -hmm. to, for somebody saying that, yes, I was sent, then yes, they could call themselves apostle. If we go a step further, looking at the use of language and words, I'll offer this. If I'm in the company of somebody who uh, was hit by an object and the object cut an artery and they are ble bleeding profusely. I have had training in first aid to know how to apply pressure to nurse a wound to stop the bleeding and maybe even save that person's life. Notice my language. I nursed the wound. Mm -hmm. Am I a nurse? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have the academic qualifications, mm -hmm. nor do I have whatever board certification beyond the academic qualification is necessary to go by that title. Hopefully that, that shed some, some light. And, and um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to answer it that way because I think, unfortunately, there is
within the body of Christ a lot of discussion in that can be combative and argumentative, which at the end of the day does not contribute to the salvation of humanity, nor does it place uh, believers in a good light as it relates to people who don't know the Lord. It, uh, the, the scripture says that the, the folk in church ought to have a good reputation among those who are not in the church. And when we start having battles about things that um, at the end of the day might not result in the salvation of another human being, we may have just wasted more time than needed to be toward a, toward a certain subject. Well, thank you so much for clarifying that. I really do appreciate you um, helping me <laughs> with my question. And, yes, ma'am. So I really do. I thank you so much for your patience and uh, clarifying that. Thank you. Well, well, you're welcome. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you are seeing in the chat, but uh, Brother Brian Fraser uh, uh, responded with a uh, with similar fashion in the in the chat, and expressed his appreciation for clarification as well. Uh, good to see you tonight, Brian. Good evening, Pastor Tyree. Hey, Brother Dave, how are you? I'm well. How are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good. That's good. Okay. Are you ready for me? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that game, hide and seek, ready or not, here you come. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the first is just a comment, because when you, when you spoke of Barnabas, you know, I, I went in my mind and the file I have on Barnabas was, it was his nickname. <laughs> but the other part about Barnabas was that folks were scared of Paul and Barnabas was the link between the, the other apostles and Paul because he had the reputation of Saul. So, and I'd never noticed that that positioning of their names in scripture where it was Barnabas first and then Saul. And I, I kind of understand it because he had, I guess, more of a reputation than, so anyway, but that's not my question. That was just my observation. Okay. My, my question is um and and here we go with me rambling then you're gonna you're gonna turn it into gold so, <laughs> so, so when i'm trying to balance galatians with acts because in acts 14 he said that we don't get saved except through the tribulation right with much tribulation but then when i'm reading uh galatians it seems like it's just you know, skittles and rainbows. And I'm trying to get the balance between it because it seems like there's there's going to be tribulation, but that's not spelled out so much in Galatians. And it's almost as though we need them both in our minds because weighing one more heavily than the other would keep us off balance. Because I, I get into the nitpicking of it all and anyway, I'll, I'll leave that for another conversation. Can you help me with that? I'll do the best I can. I, I want to make sure I understand the that the observation that you made in terms of in Acts, where the apostle says we're saved through much tribulation, and then in Galatians, you you don't you don't see that and trying to see what the balance is um and i'm assuming um and here yes you can, and here you can correct me if i'm wrong what's okay, the balance just, for, for the man or woman of faith as it, as it relates to our life in christ will we right. face tribulation or will it be easy i i i don't think that the two uh, 
are mutually exclusive. I think in Acts, the apostle uh, has this double-edged sword of recognizing that some of the men and women, and we see this in particular with Timothy, who will be his spiritual children in the ministry are timid by nature. And yet, he has to encourage them to keep the faith knowing that he himself is going to die for the very thing he's encouraging them to stay true to. Um, so, so we see that in, in Acts. In Galatians, it's more of addressing the issue that he perhaps encountered while on the missionary journey to, to that place to establish a church. Okay, I've established, and he says, uh, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? How is it that you are so soon turned to another gospel? to believing that it requires something other than what I've... So, so the epistles are more to address a specific aspect of what it means to be in Christ. And so in Galatians, what does it mean to be free in Christ? Since I've been set free and sin. What role does the law have as it relates to my salvation, as it relates to Christ, as it relates to other believers? Uh, which is why, uh, let me go back to it for one quick second. Which is why this graphic helps us see that. Well, you just can't do whatever it is that you want to do. That's the one extreme. That's boasting of a relationship without any restrictions or limits. And you don't want to be at the other extreme where you are celebrating a whole bunch of uh, rights and rules and rites of passage, but don't have a relationship that's legalism. So finding that balance of where we have the right relationship and the rules are an expression of what that relationship looks like so that those who may not know the Lord but know us by what we practice would want to emulate and be like us. Does that help, Brother Day? Um, yes, but, but it, it opened another question. Okay. And, and I think it's it's still kind of related um, because it, it seems to me that um, in, entering in, so I'm free from the law. The law is dead to me. I, I, that's all good. But it still seems like I should expect um, a battle now, right? As Paul was saying, there's going to be tribulation. Um Jesus in one of the parables, well, I guess it wasn't a parable where he said we should count the cost. So there should be some expectation of hard times, even in, even in the freedom. Absolutely. E e that there's e a, that even, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that there's, there's going to be a cost to discipleship that even in the freedom, it, it cost us something. And that something that it cost us might be a desire that we have that we 
choose to freely give up either for our own sake or for the sake of somebody else. Okay. <laughs> last, last one. So, so it seems then that the battle is, um, is, is more internal. I, I'm, I'm really battling my flesh. I'm not, I'm not out on the streets marching, battling those folks. I'm, I, the kingdom is within, so the battle is within me. Is that? And, and I'll go a step further and say the battleground would be the mind. Which is why the scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So, so that, that's, that's the battleground, the mind. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, now let's look at that from a picture rest perspective. A living sacrifice can walk off the altar Mm-hmm. has to willingly choose to stay at the place of sacrifice. And so oftentimes uh, it, it becomes, it does become the, the battleground. I think within us is a desire to know at the end of the day that we are right. And the easiest way perhaps is for somebody to tell us that you did the right thing. When we have to decide for ourselves what's right, we have to be careful that we don't make right relative. Because if we do, then what happens to the absolute and definitive of right and wrong if it becomes a moving target. And if we start moving it, then how difficult or more difficult is it to going to be to be consistent with the practice across right. the board? Right, 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 right. Right. Oh, oh, okay, I, I just need you to give me another nugget because I'm a, I'm chewing on this all week. So okay, one more nugget. The, the whole idea of let this mind be in you is such is such a passive expression, but it's so violent. Be, it's, it's in my mind. I don't know why I come up with this, but it's almost like Fred Flintstone banging on the door, Wilma, <laughs> and that's the mind that wants to get in and i'm supposed to let it in i'm supposed to let the mind of christ in but my body and my flesh fight against that and just the word let seems so calm and the whole situation is, doesn't seem calm at all okay um then let me let me help you with that have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's, it's not beyond our realm of achievement because we are in Christ and it's not a passive like let would suggest, but have this mind. Now, what mind is that? Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing 
to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So let's unpack some of these things of the mind. Uh, the first thing is not thinking more highly of oneself than they ought to. Jesus was God, but he did not count equality with God as something that he had to grasp. In other words, if we look at deity as deity, well, well let, let me not say it like that. Let me say it a more uh, enlightening way. If you had the power to not feel pain, at any point of pain, Brother Dave, would you make yourself not feel it? At every point. <laughs> okay, all right. So, then, Jesus being God, the, the question that we might ask philosophically if Jesus is God and he is, how can you kill God? You can't. However, the Bible says that he emptied himself. In other words, he maintained his deity without necessarily holding on to everything supernaturally that we tend to associate with deity. So let's pause right there and let me go back in time to the creation of the first man and the creation of the first woman, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are the only two human beings who have ever lived without sin. They were born in a sinless world. Well, they were created, rather, in a sinless world. They lost their sinless nature because of willful disobedience. I go back to Adam because there are three humans then now who have lived sinless, Adam, Eve, and Jesus. Adam and Eve lost theirs, Jesus maintained theirs. But I go back to them because Jesus did what they could not do, or did not do, rather. He did it, and he did it as a human being. Very much God, but emptying himself of all of that that we typically associate with God. Now, when we look at Jesus from that perspective, he wasn't praying to, just to show us how to pray. He was praying because oh. in humanity, that's what was needed. That's what is needed. Oh. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm going to shut my mic off. Finish, Pastor. <laughs> well, well, no, because that's, that's the point at, what, at, at where I would want you and everybody else to be, that point of realization that in having this mind, when Christ defeated Satan, he didn't do it as God on a throne in heaven. He did it as a human being on a cross. And when he 
was raised on the third day. That's the first time we hear Jesus say, all power is given unto me. The writer of Hebrews picks it up in Hebrews chapter 2 around verse, it's either 8 or 9. Says that God has placed all things under his feet. And then it says, but presently we don't see all things subjected unto him. Why? Because when we look at the created world, those who have not accepted Christ don't have this mind. And those that have accepted Christ don't always have this mind. So yes, it's going to be a constant battle to have the mind of Christ, which means that the same tools that Christ used in his humanity are for our benefit so that we might have, because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is now alive and at work in us. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Well, um, I know it's a little later than we normally stay, but this has been a great uh, discussion, great enlightenment with questions. Uh, thank you for your participation and your and your questions. Uh, uh, if there is nothing else to come before us, I'll close us out with a, a word of prayer and, and bid you a good night. Uh, Father, we just thank you for the privilege that you have given us to grow closer to you and to grow closer to one another through the study of your word. We recognize that uh, the the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh and blood, but they are mighty in you to the pulling down of strongholds. Therefore, when we are inclined to doubt you, steady our faith. When we are tempted to do wrong, make us strong to resist. When we should miss the mark, give us courage to try again, but keep ever before us the example of Christ by whose help we trust to obtain the answer to our prayer. I pray, Father, that you would uh, bless, as only you can, all who have participated in this discussion, this study tonight, whether virtually, uh, through uh, Facebook or YouTube, or through Zoom. For those who still have tasks that must be accomplished, obligations that must be satisfied before they close their eyes in sleep, I pray that for the time that they've invested, you to bless them to accomplish whatever they must do with ease. Then grant all, unto all of us a peaceful night's rest, rejuvenate and restore us, that we might be equipped for the journey on tomorrow to give you glory, uh, to advance your kingdom, and perhaps to even cause you to smile. Uh, you know our need, and we're trusting that you would provide and supply according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus, and even through those whose hearts you touch. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And Thank you, Pastor Tyree. Awesome Amen. lesson tonight. Awesome. God bless you. Thank awesome. you, Pastor. God bless Thank February. You. Thank you, Pastor. Good night. Thank you so much, Pastor. Good, Good night. night. Bless Thank you. you. Good word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. This is Deborah Smith. Yeah. I was here. I recognize I want to let voice. you know. Okay. How you doing, Pastor? I'm Thank you well. so much for that wonderful message. I'll be back okay. next Tuesday. <laughs> well, <praise God. laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Hey, Deacon.